This is like better than IMAX. This is superhero status. This is me, me and Optimus Prime. This is one of the greatest situations my parents have had unprotected sex for me to be present for. This is Fab Five Freddy. Fab Five Freddy, how you doing, young man? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. That was an incredible intro. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, Detroit. As a young man, you was in, in, inspired by many great individuals. Mm -hmm. Your godfather was none other than Max Roach. Co fellow musicians, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, those type of guys would come to hang with Max and his friends in Brooklyn, and they would jam at this big house that my dad and his friends lived in. As a Brooklyn kid, mm. how, what gave you the confidence to say, I'm going to go over the bridge? Wow, great question. Um, and I love the way you started this out, you know, knowing about like my some of my family background history, Max Roach and all that. Put two and two together and made some moves inspired by that yeah. to kind of break out of the hood. Because I always knew like if it, if they treated jazz musicians more like real artists as opposed to a sideshow in America, mm -hmm. treated them better in Europe. And they, I hear these stories. I figured the same would be true for hip hop. Correct. Which it was. Mm -hmm. Today is Malcolm X's birthday. Wow. And you have a reel wow. of, of the assassination. Yeah. So my father, I guess... Doing my homework, man. Yeah, I'm, boy, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you. So my dad was present on the day when Malcolm X was assassinated. Mm -hmm. My dad's close friend, a, a guy by the name of Willie Jones, of and would record Malcolm's speeches on mm -hmm. a little portable reel-to-reel -reel yeah, yeah. tape recorder. That tape recorder was set up on the dais and one of the first bullets went through that microphone. Tapes, cassettes, all those things are important part of our of the archive. I want to tell you, B, I'm cutting you off. That's it. Go ahead. You're a superhero, B. Uh, I know. I, 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 I'm really happy on, on success you've attained, mm -hmm. acknowledgement that people see you as such. Mm -hmm. But it's it gives me a lot of pride mm -hmm. as a kid who was raised and empowered by hip hop in my mm -hmm. culture wow. to see someone like you present, active. Mm -hmm. You always kid and I think I look back on how you were raised and that foundation you were given. Yeah, no question. 100%. And like I said, it was a blessing to find my path which was off the beaten path, if you will, yes. and been so inspired by what I came up around. And that was it. And take making the moves, you know, like going to school. Clearly, I was no dummy, but the the formal education. What, school? what high school? You I went to? to John Dewey, okay, which was a next level school at the time I went. What? But I Coney was Island? way out there. You would travel all the way to, my from Beth? Be yeah, my mom went out there. And even I didn't initially get accepted, but my mom went out and t had a talk with the assistant principal while it was in important that I go to this school. Myself, Fredro from Onyx, uh, Nems, another artist, uh, we all got arrested for graffiti. Uh, Did you? No, because I, luckily a part of, you know, doing graffiti and moving through them trains, and especially when I got with got with Lee Quinones, it was how not to get caught. Okay. How to be super <laughs> stealthy, how to move, how to know where to go, how to how to go and how to do it. So that was the thing. Because back in them days, if you got busted doing graffiti, your sentence was washing walls. Mm -hmm. They would put you in some overalls and give you some chemicals, and you'd have to wash the platform. Yeah, I had which, to clean Penn State. Yeah, see, so that was a rough uh, thing. But luckily, I avoided that but uh yeah man so. i gotta I, I, you know you, you come into this juncture of uh when you bring up lee yeah. the reason why uh you, you played a huge role in wild style was because you wanted to change the narrative and not wanted to be so negative well and, yeah so the, the, the idea for the film was an idea i had when i was planning how do i make my moves into this art world to be an artist to to, to have a position in the culture, I wanted to change the narrative. And the key thing I felt was like, if we can make a movie that can tell us, t show us in a better light, because there was no positive press for young black and Latins. Mm -hmm. We were almost always depicted as criminals. And I knew that was not the, the case. So I was like, man, if we could change the narrative and show that this, show the creative side of graffiti, show this new music developing. There was mm -hmm. barely any rap records had come out at right. that time. Maybe rap is D-Light um, in the process of working on Wild Stuff. But I was confident that this was important culture because yeah. when you'd go to a jam and three, four hundred kids was in a park at night rocking and nobody else knew outside of young kids in mm -hmm. New York City, this was important stuff. So how do we get to show it? And a part of my plan was to connect with some of these punk rock and new wave people that I was reading about, Blondie, right. Talking Heads, mm -hmm. Sex Pistols, The Clash. Mm -hmm. And I connected with 
Blondie through this guy named Glenn O'Brien on the downtown scene that became a mentor to me. At the same time, I'm linking with him is when I meet Jean-Michel Basquiat, who's mm-hmm. from Bush- Bushwick. Jean is from Bushwick. Okay. Yeah, Jean so I wanted Bushwick. to ask you about yes. him specifically because I know he's half Haitian, half Puerto Rican. Correct. Um, his father was Puerto Rican. No, his, mother was Puerto Rican, father was, was Haitian. So, because yes. I know his mom, like, from what I read, she had issues. and Yeah, a little later in life, did she you had ever some, get some health to, issues. Did you get no, to meet I them? I didn't get to meet the mom, but I met his dad okay. many times. Okay. Mr. Basquiat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's that's freaking beautiful, bro. Like, it, yeah. it just, it just it's, it's such a ride for me. Now, for you, when you say in Wild Style, there wasn't a lot of hip-hop. You yourself uh, kind of tapped into, into making songs, making music yourself. Um, yeah, that wasn't really specifically my plan. My plan was to... Oh, not even being on camera. My plan was to play the background. I wanted to be yeah. the puppeteer. Um, now, you did strength. English and French? What? English and French? And was there a French like Fab Five Freddy? No, but I did a rap record. The offer was presented to me by some people I met on the downtown scene to make a rap record Celluloid? in French. Celluloid was the label, but it was a guy that worked for a magazine named Actuel. It was a French liaison for the label for the magazine Mm -hmm. that was like the rolling stone of of france he was living on the downtown scene um they wanted to do a big article on new york culture and Mm -hmm. they met me and i'm telling them about all this new stuff going on that really nobody really knew much about so they featured me in this in a big article about this new underground culture in new york and then this guy had an idea to make a, a, a rap record in French. Yes. I never thought no anybody would hear this record. The idea was I was trying to get get my rent paid. Mm-hmm. And I figured ain't nobody going to hear this. So he wrote the, he came up with this story, wrote it out. I told him, I don't, I'm, you know, if you can write the words phonetically, like we, mm-hmm. oui, which yeah. means yes in France <laughs> is spelled O-U-Y. Okay. The equivalent was write that W-E. Mm-hmm. And all the other French words, write it out so I can sound it. Then I'll memorize it. Then I'll put the flavor on it okay. with the delivery. And that became this record called Chance de Beat. Uh-huh. So with the French, there was some little Is space left on the record. So I had a handful of rhymes that I would get on the mic at a block party. Mm-hmm. Once again, just to just to catch some girls. I wasn't trying to be a rapper, but mm-hmm. I, you know, you you had a minute on that mic, you you got noticed in the hood. And so I spit a few bars, and then the record bounced back over here as an import to okay. my surprise, right. and DJs loved it. Mm-hmm. I was mortified and shocked, because I'm like, somebody black dude, you know, me rapping in French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it worked, and then it was Graham Mix at DXT who used the record as the scratch element on Herbie Hancock's yes. Rocket, which became a humongous hit record. It did. And then a domino effect happens where the real Roxanne, Eric B and Rakim, a whole list of amazing records wanted to use that same yeah, scratch yeah, yeah. sound. Mm-hmm. So the sound on my record, Sean's the Beat, at the end of the B side of my record, where I go, ah, oh, this stuff is really fresh. And they run that through a vocoder to yeah, give yeah. it like like See, like fresh, a yeah. like a robotic type of Look sound. At this guy became this scratch element yeah. that's been scratched, sampled, if you will, on over a thousand records. It's something I want people to know that Grandmaster, uh, DXT, Rocksteady Crew, Futura, oh, yeah. the gentleman I'm with right here, was on the first hip-hop tour. Yes, yeah, so as a result of all of us, I guess I stirred up a lot of noise on the downtown scene in New York. A lot of other people got open to what was going on with this rap culture. There was an English chick that got an opportunity to promote a night at a roller skating rink called the Roxy as mm-hmm. roller skating started to fall off a little bit. Go for it. And so she was like, you know, we want to put on a hip hop thing. She'd read, she'd seen Wild Style, was mm-hmm. hip to this new thing going on. So this became the first place on the downtown scene where you really mixed uh, black and Latin kids from Harlem, the Bronx, and Low East Side with the punk rock new wave people. Which was phenomenal about culturally, a cultural exchange about Roxy was that there were Zulu meetings there, there, uh-huh. were, there were gay nights there, there yeah. were all types of events taking place, but it was so uh, reflective of the city. Correct, and that was a first. I remember the first night when you had this big mix of these two scenes, uh, this woman, this English woman, her name was Lady Cool, we called her Cool Lady Blue. Yes. She had gotten a copy of this movie 
that was never really released about the the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. This was one of the breakout punk rock groups from England. Mm -hmm. And so when she got a, she opened the club early one Friday night with the screening of this film. So all the punk rock people, new wave people that was up on the Sex Pistols came. But then after the film, Bambada, Africa Islam, DXT on the turntables playing hip hop, and then the homies from the hood come, and everybody mixed together perfectly. The punk rockers were checking out the hip hop people and their styles. Hip hop people, street people, was checking yeah. out these punk rock people and their styles. I love it. And everybody came together, party with each other. Yeah. Boy meets girl, girl meets yeah, boy. You know, it. a lot went down. Drugs meet people. That's right. People <laughs> lighting up. Back in them days, you know, you, you know, you you could blow a joint in the club mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. was all good and yep. so it was a fun time and that <laughs> opened up that was one of the first kind of times when people from other cultures other spaces other races got to experience this whole new culture and, mm -hmm. and, and got down with it being a brooklyn kid myself mm -hmm. and zulu meetings and rocksteady crews yeah, and all yeah. that stuff i also know about grandmaster flowers oh man this is great wow you guys up here are really dialed in so you know before there was this thing called hip hop, it was this disco DJ thing that went down and Flowers was from that set. Before disco became a commercial thing that the record companies really kind of dived all into, um, uh, black and Latin DJs would bring their sound systems to the streets, to the parks, mm -hmm. and play records in this unique way. Just keeping the music going with a mixer was a phenomenal innovation because prior to that, what most people had in their home was a you'd have a stack of 45s you would sit on the record player and it would drop a record down play it took about 20 30 seconds for the next record to drop and play it. that's how you party yes um this dj thing mixing blending the music back and forth was a major innovation so that was really what disco was about mm -hmm. grandmaster flowers was one of those guys um he also was a graffiti writer he used yeah. to tag up flowers and dice was one of his boys okay so i'd see their tags just on walls throughout brooklyn and then there were other guys like frankie d um master d ak who later became D, DJ Lance. These yes. guys were friends of mine. And we would, these were the guys in Brooklyn, particularly in Bed Stuy, that I followed that came out into the parks at night, project parks, block parties, and jam. And that idea of those DJs is what inspired hip hop. That's who Cool Herc and those guys wanted to be. Yes. It was one of the top guys in that disco era was Pete DJ Jones. And he apparently at one point got with Flash and gave Flash and them some knowledge on how to improve their electronics on the sound systems. Do you feel, because there was cameras in mm. the Bronx mm. capturing that, it kind of didn't acknowledge what was happening in Queens and Brooklyn as well? Somewhat. It's just that if you can imagine... Literally, from the late late 60s is when this disco thing starts. I mm -hmm. found a, a magazine article. This was I was still a shorty. I wasn't aware of none of this. But it went back to the late 60s and uh, the, the idea of a mobile disco DJ. And then that got big into the 70s. Man. By the mid-70s, this is the thing that moves parties citywide. And Herc and those guys in the Bronx, they wanted to be a part of that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the disco thing wanted you to dress up a little bit. Okay. To have some shoes on. In fact, on the flyers for these disco parties for Frankie D, Flowers, et cetera, they would always put no sneakers. Okay. That was a message to real hood cats. If you can't dress up, don't come. Okay. And this is before you wore your sneak. You got fresh leather sneakers. This is when we wore our sneakers down, like right. the old Converse and all that stuff. So Herc, I remember talking to Cool Herc about this, and he was like, man, listen, that was the crowd we wanted, those kids that only had sneakers, okay. that couldn't afford those parties. Okay. And then Cool Herc did something different with that disco concept. He brought in these break the beats breaks, yeah. and went way left to what right, that's good. everybody else was doing. And then he had these guys that would talk on the mic, Coke LaRock, Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember the other cat, Clark Kent, Coke mm -hmm. Rock. They would just shout out. They had a cool way of talking. They had a little echo chamber. Yeah. Who came to Herc's parties were Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore. Cast that with then and the other MCs. Become the ecosystem of what, what it was. Correct. Rhyming, Man. scratching, cutting, and mixing, all pioneered by these Bronx 
innovators. Right. So they took this DJ thing to another level, and that became this thing called hip hop. Fab Five Freddy. Wow. I so much, but I know time is valuable, and I wanted to ask you. Um, there's a great documentary you produced, IFC Films. I had the great pleasure of having a screener and watching it. Mm. I want to tell you that the uh, where it takes place. Right in the hood. Right. Fun fact, you ready for this? Go. Takashi 69 used to work in there when it was a deli. Oh my it's God. It's still a deli. Wow. That same location. Unbelievable. That's where <laughs> Ghost happened, you know, uh, uh, Patrick Swayze, you know, when the end, the murder scene is right under that train station right yes, there. Because the I'm a murder and Broadway kid. That was my train. Boy, oh boy, the elevator. Yeah, the L. Wow. I did not know that. So, yeah, this film is called Hold Your Fire, uh, directed by good friend Stefan Forbes. And it's about a hostage situation. These Muslim brothers go to rob this place for some guns yes. to protect themselves. Right. Police thought they were the Black Liberation Army that were raging at that time and mm -hmm. had killed cops. Mm -hmm. um, this turns into a hostage situation. The police show up, shots are fired. And what comes out of this incident is the beginning of hostage negotiation, which mm -hmm. exists the world over. Um, a cop by the name of Harvey Schlossberg was a traffic cop, had just gotten his PhD. And when the typical solution would have been throw some tear gas in and go in oh, guns, bus, yeah, okay. guns blazing, mm -hmm. like they did at the Attica prison uprising, which had happened just about a year or so prior. Correct. Over 40 people were... were great were, documentary as well. Yeah, great documentary, I think on Showtime. And that was what was eventually going to end up happening at this sporting goods store mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. And they got this this guy... A degree in psychology, Harvey Schlossberg, that came in and they listened and he talked it down. Wow. He de escalated. He did. And so the film is an incredible, dramatic, tense film. Sheesh, bro. Takes you back to the 70s. There's some graph kids that I hung with that got a few tags okay. on the walls around that time that made me act like, you know, Woo. jump out of my seat. Nice. But, um, what we're hoping with with people seeing Hold Your Fire, which opens this Friday and will be available video on demand, but it opens coast to coast, mm -hmm. is that if police, I was never down with defunding the police. I pay my taxes. Mm -hmm, I want the police, mm -hmm. you know, Presence. to do what I pay them for. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to see some better training. Mm -hmm. And if they could see how a New York cop... Harvey Schlossberg talked this situation down, de-escalated. Yeah. This became something that exists the world over, mm -hmm. but not enough police in this country are using these tactics is what we want people to understand. And we'd like Eric Adams, the mayor, and other uh, uh, who was a cop for over 20 right. years, and and to for police chiefs and police officers coast to coast to come and see this film, and let's work to get uh, these tactics working so that we don't have to see people gunned down as soon as the cops roll up, point blank, gun, gunned down, dead yes. um, in the streets. So much I could talk to you about, especially being a dad, Brooklyn and Spike Lee era. There's so many things I have, but my bro. I'll come back. Can I just say one thing about that old school stuff we were talking about? There's a cool documentary that a homie of mine did called Founding Fathers of Hip Hop. You can see this on YouTube. Queens. It's, it gets deep into the Queen scene, but it also touches on Frankie D, Pete DJ Jones, Grandmaster D, and it tells that story that happened before hip hop. So Founding Fathers, y'all, on YouTube. Check it. Guys, listen. I don't like him as a ping pong player, but everything else he's done with his life is phenomenal. <laughs> I got jokes over here. <laughs> <laughs> Destroy the building. Wow, bro. Hold your fire. I'm, I'm super honored. Make sure you guys check out the documentary. It's worth your time. Uh, great education. And uh, I can't wait to show uh, my homies and for my homies to see it because a lot of us played around in that. Man. In that. You know, they also did Fresh uh, right there on that block. Well, I'll tell you another thing. I was a consultant on American Gangster. Yes, that you film. were. And they gave you a little cameo, too. Yeah, they gave me a cameo. Um I, I took a cameo. I mm -hmm. wasn't trying to, but there's a, like, I thought, but you going to be in this? But a lot of that <laughs> was shot on Broadway as well because yeah. Broadway under that L still has a raw, Look. gritty, 
edge that yeah. you can't find you in can't. a lot of New Red York Red Man, City. AZ, uh, Rockham, a lot of people did music. Common did right there. It's wow. as gritty as it's I didn't know. It. it still got that raw, real New York texture yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that takes you back in time. And uh, that's where Hold Your Fire takes place yes. you'll see mad homies come out because it was a hostage scene and there's hundreds of kids that was out making noise and nuts but this is flying. Uh, 73 73 73 my parents moved in 72 Amazing. that block melrose <sighs> man wow how the neighborhood has changed hasn't it crazy right <laughs> listen man fat five freddy make sure you get it tattooed on your back <laughs> He's amazing. He's phenomenal. I am Destroy. Thank you to everybody who's listening. We're going to continue on with some more, some more greatness right here on Shade 45. Thank you, Destroy. Wow, that was excellent. <laughs>